All right, what do we do? Purple. 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 Let's go. All right. Um, what's, up, everybody? what's up, everybody? My name is Zach Clark Wen. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, before I get started, I do want to just acknowledge uh, Steven Trotter and Jordan and Malachi and Jody and my team that like welcomed me to campus today and took such good care of me. The work that they're doing over there at the Wellness Center is is really inspiring. You know, it's really inspiring. It's really important, and it really touched me to to watch them and the way that they leaned in and, and welcomed to me. Uh, the way I got here is, I think Jordan uh, sent me an email. I don't know, like three months ago, and said they were having this safe spring break and they'd love for me to come out and talk and share some of my story with all of you. And that's, that's really how I got here. So shoot or shoot, take your shot. Sometimes, you know, you get a response. And so that's, that's the moral of that story. Um, I want to make a couple things clear before I, before I get rolling tonight. The first is I'm absolutely not here to tell you not to party, not to drink, not to go out, not to have fun. That is like the furthest thing from what I'm, what I'm trying to do here tonight. Um, so we can all like remove that, like the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna be shoving something down your throat that feels really aggressive or whatever like that. That's not, that's not what I'm doing here tonight. Um, what I am here to do tonight is to try to find some commonality, uh, try to share some of my story with all of you, which I hope will resonate. Uh, the reality is that, you know, mental health and, and substance abuse numbers are skyrocketing. Uh, there has been an increase in death by suicide. There has been an increase uh, in overdoses in our country. And we just need to be smarter, right? And we just need to come together and acknowledge that you never really know what's going on with something. And it's one of the things that stuck with me to this moment, it really hit me hard when I was talking to Steven in his office today, and we were just kind of checking up, uh, catching up, as he was sharing a story about uh, a guy that uh, we, had, we had lost. And in his, in his note, he kind of said, check on the strong ones, right? And that really resonated with me, because in my story, and as I get into it, you're going to kind of hear that to the outside world, my life looked like I was kind of kicking ass and taking names. That's what it looked like. On the inside, I was fighting some demons that I wasn't really able to get, to get honest about. Um, so that's kind of the disclaimer to get that started. The second thing I want to do is just introduce myself. Uh, so again, my name is Zach Clark. I uh, acknowledge and recognize that some of the room, probably mostly the, the women in attendance, know me because I was on a reality television show, The Bachelorette. That said, I am, I am much more than that, and I acknowledge that, right? And so I'm the CEO of a pretty large behavioral health care company up in New York City. If you're ever in the city, please swing by. We'd love to host you for a day. Uh, we really take a great deal of pride in helping people who are struggling with mental health and substance abuse disorder. So I, I as you will hear in my story, took what some would see as my greatest weakness, right, and turned it into my biggest strength, and I've made a, a career out of it where um, I live a pretty beautiful life today. I'm 39 years old. I live in New York City. I grew up uh, right outside of Philadelphia, so I'm a diehard Philly sports fan. I love the brand Pearl Jam. I play golf. Not very good. Um, I've run 11 marathons, right? So like these are the things that kind of make me who I am. My parents are kind of still my best friends because I'm a mama's boy. And uh, yeah, that's me. And the reason I introduced myself is because if you would have asked me when I was in college, who I am, I would have had no idea. I couldn't even answer that question. Like, who, who, who am I? You know, like, that's just it's such a bizarre thing to ask a 19-year-old. And I was in college 20 years ago, so I can't imagine um, how you all are doing in answering that question with all the BS that's out in the world. So that's who I am. Um, and again, the reason I am here is to hopefully so here's the deal. If you're sitting in this audience, you should be proud of yourself. I don't know what got you here. There's a reason you're sitting here. And I want to take a moment and also acknowledge that and acknowledge you for showing up. It would have been very easy for you guys to like kick it in your dorm room or not be here on a Tuesday night. And you decided to be here. So I thank you for that. On top of that, 
my hope is that my story, there will be some part of my story that you can identify with or that you might be able to utilize as you move forward in life to help a friend, a family member, a coworker, someone in your life who, who might need to ask for help. And the way I see it is asking for help is a very broad thing. Yes, for me it meant like I was a drug addict and I was struggling with my mental health and I had to put my hand up and ask for help. But I know for me, like when I was in college, I couldn't even, I, like I couldn't walk into the gym and ask for someone to like spot me on the bench. I couldn't ask for help on a paper. I, I didn't, because I was so embarrassed about what that would mean and how people would judge me. Right? I was always working double time to make the outside world believe that I was something that I wasn't. So um, I'm going to launch into my story. It's going to be, you know, it's 6.20 now. I will have you out of here by 7. I plan on taking like 25 minutes here. It's pretty gnarly. There's some surgeries. There's some arrests. There's some DUIs. We'll get into all that stuff. And so if nothing else, have a laugh, hang out, like whatever it is, whatever you want to take away from this, that's totally cool. Um, but my hope is to inspire. My hope is to start a conversation. And my hope is that you'll say hello to me after, and we'll kick it at the reception and have a good night. And I think we're going to get hot dogs at that place afterwards. So um, let's, uh, let's do it. So as I mentioned, uh, I grew up in, I'm going to do this first, so I'm like sweating up here. Give me a second. Woo! A little spicy. I got another ECU shirt under, under it, so. All right, this is the right one? Nope. All right, so here's the deal. I started, uh, I remember having my first drink. It was a Miller High Life. Uh, I succumbed to peer pressure at like the age of 14, 15 years old. And I can tell you that I'm one of five kids. I had a very awesome, incredible upbringing. Uh, my parents are still married today, as I mentioned earlier. And I really never wanted for anything. I didn't. You know, there was no trauma, there was no abuse, there was nothing in my childhood that would lead me to end up in the positions that I got myself into. Um, but what I can tell you is that when I took that first drink, something shifted in me and I loved it. I loved it. And I launched into kind of like this high school and college drinking career where I thought I was like in the movie dazed and confused, right? So like on the weekends in high school, I would run out to the woods and we would get our case of Natty Light and the flask of Captain Morgan and we would go out, we'd make the big bonfire, and we'd belt out you know, songs until 2 a.m. and run from the cops and, and do all the things we do as high schoolers. And no one saw it as a problem because like, everyone's drinking, right? Everyone's hanging out. So it was, it was normal. All the while, like, I'm playing three sports, I'm getting good grades, I'm dating girls, I'm like, doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing so that the outside world doesn't think there's anything wrong with me. And quite frankly, there wasn't anything wrong with me. I can, I can say that. Um, I remember when it came time to think about college, I was a baseball player. So I like had a couple kind of like D1 opportunities and like I was like, I was like decent, right? And then a couple D3 opportunities. And I remember that uh, me and my old man were driving in a car and it was like a 1996 GMC Jimmy, it was a truck. And we had seen Gettysburg, which is a college out in Pennsylvania and then York College, where I ended up going in the same day. And we were driving home uh, from that college visit, and my dad looked at me, he said, if you go to Gettysburg, you're gonna be paying off that college tuition for a very long time. If you go to York College, you can have the car we're driving in. York was substantially cheaper than, than Gettysburg, so I said, sweet, I'm in, give me the car, let's go with York. And I laugh when I look back at that, because college is such a formative time in our lives, it's such a big decision. There's so much stress and energy around these four years of our lives. And I sat there within 12 seconds, and my dad like dangled this little thing in front of me. I said, sure, let's do it. So what I'm trying to say is like, while it seems very stressful to be in these seats, while it might feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, I'm gonna encourage you to like have fun with these four years, not take yourself so seriously. You're going to fail some tests. You're going to be late. You're going to oversleep. You're going to make some bad decisions. I did all those things and more. 
and I live to tell about it. The world tells us that we need to be like these perfect people. I don't want to be perfect. I love making mistakes because I get to learn from those mistakes. I talk about it all the time in, in, in our leadership meetings at, at the company, like let's make mistakes and let's learn from them. Let's make mistakes and get better. And so I jumped into college and like college was a, a, a pretty good experience for me, right? Like the thing that changed for me though is my relationship with alcohol just strengthened and strengthened and strengthened. And so in high school, I was sitting there and I was going out, you know, drinking in the woods for every Friday and Saturday night. And then in college, two things kind of happened. I showed up on, on the campus at York, Pennsylvania, York College, and I felt like I had this black belt in drinking and that I needed to show everyone around me how to drink because all the other kids were kind of showing up there at different levels of their kind of like drinking careers, if you will. And I really took that seriously. I took that seriously to the point where like, I made it my mission to get people hammered with me and drink with me and go out with me. And I'll, I'll never forget like getting in trouble the first semester and like getting kicked off the team for a couple of days and the chaos in my life and the consequences from drinking started in college. But I never acknowledged it and I never asked for help. I never said to anyone like, hey, this might be a problem. And as I look back at that time in my life, I just remember like, I was so scared to just be who I was. I was so scared to just be honest and put my hand up and say, is it normal that like every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, I'm blacking out, I'm ending up with random people in my bed, like I don't remember anything. Instead, I just shoved it all down and I assumed that's what like college was all about. And to a certain degree, maybe it is, right? Like maybe it is. Maybe, maybe college is this experience in life and this time in our, in our existence where we make some decisions that aren't so great and we learn from them. But for me, it was a little bit more. The idea of asking for help never crossed my mind. It just never crossed my mind. And so I continued on with my life in college. And what I did is like, I met a girl my sophomore year who I would kind of like hold hostage and I would end up marrying her down the road. I did everything I could in every other area of my life so that no one could question my drinking or drugging. And I got out of there in four years and I had a decent career on the, on the baseball field. But my life was starting to slowly be controlled by substances, right? I was doing Adderall to study, I was doing coke to party, I was doing, you know, smoking weed to go to practice, like whatever it was. It didn't matter what the drug was, what the drink was, anything to make me not feel like the weight of the world. And I identify and I acknowledge that. Sorry. And so for all of you sitting there listening to me, like maybe you identify with that, maybe you don't. You know, maybe you have a completely normal, benign relationship with substances, and that's totally cool. No judgment from me. But if you do identify with it and you want to look into it, or you, there is help. There are people you can talk to. You can have conversations with your classmates. I was always terrified as a young person to like call one of my friends and say like, hey, like I'd love to talk about the game or the bet we won or whatever else was going on, but I, I'd like to kind of talk about some stuff that's going on with me. And college is the first time in my life where I really should have asked for help and I just didn't, right? And instead I just kind of like listened to the world and mind you, this is like 20 years ago, so there's no social media, you know, there's no COVID, there's no pandemic. This thing is not like a nightmare. And so for me, thinking about you guys and the seats that you fill right here tonight, it's like, it's almost an impossible job. 
it's almost an impossible job to be a college student today. And that's why I encourage you to like have fun and not take it so seriously and have real conversations and understand that life is a long journey. And these four years are supposed to be really special. These four years are meant to be formative. These four years are, are supposed to kind of like shape some of the ways you're going to move forward in the world. And I have hope. I have hope because of the way I was greeted today. I have hope by some of the work that's going on on this campus and, and nationwide as I go out and talk to other, to other colleges. So after I graduated from college, I, I like launched into the world and I thought I was going to kind of keep playing baseball. That didn't work out. I'll never forget, like, I had this tryout and it didn't go well. And me and my dad, like, went right down to the Applebee's down the street and started drinking together. Because now the substance has really started to be this thing that could quiet my mind and not make, not make me feel. So anytime something came up, I would just turn to the drink or the drug. <clears throat> and what happened was I stayed in this, so I, I moved back home to South Jersey. This girl that I had met my sophomore year, I moved her home with me. She got a job teaching. She was like a two glass of wine, totally normal, amazing woman who I quite frankly didn't deserve. And I was out there like ripping and running. I got my first job in like a corporate setting and I immediately found the people in that office that partied the way that I did. You know, like, it, there's that, like, cheesing saying, like, your, your vibe attracts your tribe or whatever it is. Like, that, I was, like, on that. Like, I was going to go find the people that partied the way I did. And it was a crazy sequence of events because I started this job. I had some early success in business. I started making money, and I felt like there were no rules in the world. And what happened was about two years into that job, I was, I was packing up my car, um, to go to the Jersey. Anybody from Jersey here? A couple, wow, not many. All right, well, I was packing up my car to go to the Jersey Shore for the weekend, and I had been feeling like shit. I was seeing kaleidoscopes, and I knew there was something wrong with me. But at this point, everyone in my life wasn't really taking me seriously. So when I went to my family and said, I think there's something wrong with me, they basically said, you're just hungover. Turns out, I go to this little like side of the road, x-ray place, this woman, who I think had never seen anything wrong on an x-ray, does this scan. She comes back to me. She's like, you need to sit right there. There's an ambulance on the way. There's something really wrong with you. And I was like, oh, shit. Within 12 hours, I'm at University of Penn Hospital getting a tumor cut out of the back of my head. Right? And so this is the first moment in my life where there's like this thing that happens that kind of just stopped everything. And I can tell you that. What happened there is insane because I was in the hospital for 25 days. I'm learning to walk, talk, eat, all, you know, all that stuff all over again. I was never alone for one minute. Like I had people bringing me soft pretzels and water ice and cheese steaks and we were watching, you know, the Phillies play in the hospital bed. But it was this crazy thing because I sat there and I had like no emotion. Everyone was like, oh, you're going to be this hero. You're going to go out into the world. And you're going to like, be, make such a difference because you have this second lease on life. I'm like, really? I kind of just want to like, get out there and go party again. Because that's where I feel like the most comfortable. And what happened, and as we've heard, and like the story goes, I was introduced to some pretty strong medication while I was in that hospital bed. Percocet and Oxycontin and all that stuff. And it was kind of just coming onto the scene. Like they hadn't really figured out how lethal these drugs were. So I, they sent me home with like a grip of, of meds. And I'm like, let's party. You know, like, let's, let's do this. And so at 24 years old, here I am like coming out of this surgery, coming out of this near-death experience where everyone in my life can't say shit to me because like I'm some kind of hero. And this is like my, my cape or like this thing that protects me from the world. And it was the perfect storm for a guy like me because I used that and I ran with it. And what happened was over like the next year, I ran really, really hard. And the only thing that I knew to do 
to kind of continue to push my life forward was to get on one knee and propose to my college sweetheart. Because that was like the one relationship and the one thing that was still felt like really safe to me. It was like that first love, like that first everything. And I was like, I am just gonna do this. And once this is settled, I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna have like this beautiful suburban life and everything's gonna be solved. So she said yes. And in June of 2009, we got married down at the Jersey Shore. We had you know, the big 250 person wedding. I think like four of my friends got DUIs that weekend. It was like the first wedding of all, of all, my, of all my friends. And it was, it, it was insanity. Like I, I, I was pretty much blacked out the entire time. But I promised myself that on the honeymoon, and this is where like the delusional thinking comes into play. And the people in my life are starting to recognize that like, this isn't really normal, but at the same time, no one really had like the chutzpah to come to me and say like, hey, you have a problem. And so I end up on this honeymoon down in the Virgin Islands and I promise myself that I'm gonna detox there. And I actually kind of do. We go on this honeymoon, we have this beautiful trip, I like sober up, I start to feel normal for the first time in, in a couple years. And I landed back in Philadelphia at the airport and the first thing I knew to do was to send a text message to my drug dealer. And like I was off and running once again. What happened over the next two years was, was insanity. Like it was just insanity. And I'll tell you a couple, you know, quick stories here. I, in, November of 2010, so I got married in July of 2009, July 2009 in November 2010, I, I ended up in drug treatment for the first time. My, uh, my mom and wife at the time were out swirling some Chardonnay at a local bar and one of my buddies, who I actually ended up getting sober at a later date, so I got him back, but went up to them and said to them that I had a problem. And they came home and I said, you're absolutely right, and I got in the car and I went to treatment. I had no idea what I was doing. I knew that I needed help. I had known that I had needed help for a very long time. I knew that I was a really good liar. And outside of that, I was just gonna say yes because that was gonna like kind of take the heat off me. And so I end up in treatment and I do like the whole like 28 days in treatment and I get out of there and I'm, I'm basically like loaded within five days. Like I didn't listen to anything that they said to do. I did the same shit that I've been doing for my whole life, which is like tell the people in my life what they wanted to hear, not what I was actually feeling. I continued to kind of roll this persona out to the world that was not really who I was. And the dishonesty sat right here in my spirit and in my soul. And I wasn't, I just wasn't, I wasn't ready. What happened is, and this is like one of the keystones of my story, which I hope you all hear. Because again, I'm not here to tell you how to live. But what I am here to tell you is that if we are able to open our eyes and be aware and have honest conversations with the people in our lives that we, that, we, that we love the most, you might save someone's life. And so my wife at the time, when I got out of that treatment center and she caught me drinking and drugging again, she basically said, it's over. And she set a boundary with love and compassion and she looked me in the eye and she just said, Zach, I can't do this anymore. It's not about you, it's about me protecting myself. And she was 100% right. And in that moment, she saved my life. Not immediately, though. Over the next eight months, I went on the run of all runs. I, I can tell you just like a few cliff notes from that time. Uh, the Eagles played in a playoff game. And I woke up Monday morning extremely hungover and had run out of my pills 
and I didn't know what to do, and I called my buddy Chris up, and I made up some injury, like I, this like pain in my side, and he took me to the hospital, and I proceeded to get my gallbladder cut out of my body just so I could get pills for a couple days. Like that's how far I took this thing. And I sometimes hesitate to tell a story like that because I saw some of the gasps, gasps in, the, in the audience, right? And if you think about it, it's insane. And the reason sometimes I hesitate to tell that story is because I don't want you to hold on to something and like if you do start to struggle or someone in your life, but I wasn't as bad as that guy. And so I challenge everyone to like identify with the feeling and not like what I was actually doing. Um, I ended up getting in a car accident, so, so like my, my substance use progressed to the point where um, I kind of like graduated to the street life, which means I was running around a place called Camden, New Jersey. Uh, I tried heroin for the first time. I started smoking crack cocaine. It was a gnarly, gnarly existence for eight months. I, I got in a car accident at one point, and uh, they put my car in the pound, and I remember I had a bunch of drugs in the car, and I had to sneak into the pound at night because I knew my dad was getting the car back the next morning. Like, I just did the craziest stuff, and I managed to keep pulling it off. Like, I managed to keep people kind of off my back for a little while. And I was resilient. I was resilient. Like, even in my darkest days, like, I was resilient. Um, and that's one of my best qualities today. It's like I got a lot of grit and I'm pretty, I'm pretty damn resilient. And so what ends up happening is in August of 2000, so I got sober on August 30th of 2011. So I'm, I'm basically, I'm about 11 and a half years sober. Um, in August of 2011, I am like bottoming out. It is like no good. Uh, you know, we do have a history of some substance abuse and alcoholism in my family, so it was just a really kind of like sore and hot topic. And I just remember that it, it, it's all kind of a blur, but what happened was I ended up, my family was on vacation down the Jersey Shore, and I ended up leaving because a hurricane was coming, and I knew that I had to beat the storm to get back up to like Camden, like right outside of Philly, to pick up or else I was gonna get sick because I was physically dependent on, at this point um, on the drugs. And I ended up getting arrested. My car got impounded. I snuck into my dad's office. I stole one of his checks. And on a Friday morning, I went to a PNC bank in, in Camden. And there was a bank teller there. Her name was Rhonda Jackson. Rhonda is an angel in my life. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was gonna completely change my entire existence. And so what I tried to do is I tried to cash this check, and at the time, if you can picture it, I'm like 250 pounds, I have this big, like, horrible fro, I'm completely, like, out of my mind. And she knew it. She knew it. And this is the gift that I'm gonna give to all of you, like, you all have the power to change a life. And Rhonda did that for me in that moment. Because she called my dad. It was actually a Saturday, because the crazy part is my, my, it was a Saturday morning. My dad happened to be at work. He doesn't work on Saturdays. She called him from an unknown number. He picked up the phone. Like, all this crazy stuff had to happen in order for him to even get contacted. I had, like, thrown my phone. Like, I wasn't reachable. And uh, he rushed down to the bank and, and like, when I thought I was gonna get, you know, a couple thousand dollars to go turn some tricks out in the, in the streets, my dad rolled through, white as a ghost, put his arm on my arm and said, son, we're going home. And in that moment, my entire life changed. In that one moment, because it was this beautiful thing that happened where someone knew that I needed help And I became willing to actually be honest for one split second. Two days later, I end up at a treatment center in Pennsylvania called Karen Treatment Centers. I ended up staying there for four and a half months. What I can tell you about this experience at 27 years old is it was the first time that I had done therapy. I thought therapy was for losers. 
It was the first time I had been honest about my feelings. It was the first time that someone sat across me and said, I'm gonna love you until you can love yourself. Like, it's, it's okay. And that's all shit that I didn't know I needed to hear. And God, I wish I heard it 10 years earlier because it was so true. And it provided me with this environment to finally get honest about who Zach was. And so for the next four months, I really dug in. And it was a pretty gnarly four months. I, I got divorced in, in, in rehab. I sold my house in rehab. None of my family was talking to me. None of my friends were talking to me. Like I was in a total jackpot. At 27 years old, like if you guys are tripping about what you're gonna do when you get out of college, at 27 years old, I had nothing, zero, zilch. Not a dollar to my name. No friends, nothing. And I was in my mind like one of the cool kids and this and that. And like I had built this whole, I had worked so hard to build this whole persona up. And at 27, I had nothing. So if you're sitting there today and you're like a little confused or nervous about the test tomorrow, or like what's going to happen on Friday, or if this guy's going to ask you out, or like if she texted you some short response, like what does this mean? It's not that big of a deal. And what happened for me is I kind of had, like I don't want to get too far out there because I'm a pretty spiritual guy, but I had a spiritual experience while I was in treatment. Like I really learned and understood that I had to truly love myself and the, relate, the most important relationship that I was going to have on this planet was with the person looking back at me. And at 39 years old, I still struggle with that shit sometimes. Not every day is great. My mentals have been off for the past couple weeks. I was sharing it today. I have tools now, right? Like I have tools. And so what happened is I moved to New York City. I had never been to New York City in my life. I've been there one time for a Simon and Garfunkel concert. I'm sure half this room or most of this room doesn't even know who Simon and Garfunkel is, but I digress. I had never partied there and I moved there to start a new life. I bet on myself. And that's exactly, what, that's exactly what I went on to do, right? That's exactly what I went on to do. I took my recovery very seriously. For me, right, this is for me. I knew that I couldn't safely drink or do drugs. I couldn't do it. As much as I tried, it was a no-fly zone. It took what it took for me to get to that point. Showing up in New York City, knowing zero people, I had to like really put myself out there. And I ran around that city, and I ran around that city, and I met friends, and I met people, and I destroyed this notion that because I was sober, or because I wasn't drinking, that I couldn't have fun. I can tell you that I, my life today is next level. Like the shit I get to do on a daily basis is beyond anything any shot of heroin, any hit of crack, any case to the dome that I could have like ever imagined. I am actually happy today, which is something I'm really proud of. And so over the next 11 years is like the good stuff. I'm in New York City, I'm getting sober, I'm learning how to be honest. I'm learning how to show up in relationships. I'm learning how to be a good employee. I'm learning that it's important to like be on time, look people in the eye, like the basic stuff that I missed out on. And all of a sudden, with this goodwill that I'm putting out into the, to the world, this good energy that I'm putting out into the world, things are starting to happen. After five years of being sober, I decided to go out on my own and start my own company. It was another one of those moments where I was like testing myself, but I knew that I wanted to lead. I knew that I wanted to inspire change. Today, that company employs 75 people. We have 65 kind of high-end, highly structured transitional living beds throughout New York City and Westchester County. I get the opportunity to go out on a bunch of interventions and work with families who are in crisis and make a living doing it. I don't actually feel like I work. 
the culture and what we've created in New York City is unbelievable. And not all those people are sober. Absolutely not. The people that choose to do this work with me are heroes. They have a real desire to change the world. Like I said, I've been able to run the New York City Marathon the last eight years. I've run two London marathons. I've done all this crazy stuff. And the formula was just so, so simple. Like, ask for help when I need it. Be a nice person. Don't try to be the cool guy. Call people back, text people back. If you go on a date and it doesn't go well, like you can call them and say, hey, it was really a nice time. I don't think this is going anywhere. Like just the little life lessons that I learned have catapulted me into this existence that I never could have imagined. And as I said earlier, that crazy, gnarly experience of being a heroin addict and a drug addict and just whatever, tearing my family down, is now my greatest strength. The treatment center that I went to, I'm now on their board of trustees. I'm like the youngest guy in the room by 20 years. And then the kicker, um, and I'm going a little over here, but there'll still be like five, six minutes for, for questions, and I'll hang around, and we'll hang out in the back, and we'll, what's, it, what's the hot dog place? Sup dogs, yeah, we'll go there. It's on me. Just come be my friend. Um, the kicker is I walk into my apartment in uh, March of 2020, and COVID, like New York City is shut, it's apocalyptic. I mean, if you're like from New York or know anything about what was going on there during COVID, like it was insanity. And I pick up my phone and it's a Friday night and we're, we're working around the clock. Like we still have, we're treating patients, the whole thing. And I look at my phone and LA's calling. I'm like, LA, and I pick up. And she's like, hey, this is so-and-so. And I work on this television. So I was like, leave my, lose my number. Like lose my number. Like this is not who I am. I don't do that stuff. And um, she said, well, hold on a minute. Can I just tell you how we got your information? And she went on to tell me that like my sister had put in this application because she thought I was never gonna fall in love and I was just like, you know, like working so hard and it was like, you gotta be kidding me. All right, I love my sister, keep going. And the life lesson there for me in that experience and what like sobriety and not taking myself too seriously taught me was just to like take the next step. And so like I did an interview and then I did another interview and all of a sudden I'm getting tested for STDs and I'm like, okay, I guess this is happening, right? Like I guess this is happening. And it was the middle of uh, COVID. It was the middle of COVID. The world was shut down. So in my mind, I was kind of like, all right, I, I have to do this. Like you only live once. There's no, like I'm not missing out on anything. Everyone is just like locked up in their apartments. So at 36 years old and nine or eight years sober, I launch out to LA to go on this television show. Like, what am I doing? And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna get into like the actual experience and yes, I fell in love and it was this beautiful thing and, 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 and all that stuff. But the thing I wanna focus on is like the number one question I get in the world about that thing, about that show, about the Bachelorette is like, weren't all the other guys like getting loaded? Like, weren't, like, like wasn't everyone like drinking? Wasn't it hard to be there? And I was like, absolutely. Everyone was drinking, everyone was having fun. For me, I was like, thank God they look like assholes. Like, this is just like, <laughs> it's the flipping of like the mindset. And I was able to go there stone cold sober, have an unbelievable experience. And like I'm doing with this room, tell my story on national television because guess what, like, I don't have to make up anything anymore. This is just who I am. If you wanna like me, that's awesome, let's party. If you don't like me, that's cool too. Like, I'm totally fine with that. I really am because I've decided to stop giving my power away. I've decided to just stop giving it away to the relationship or to the thing to the money, to the paycheck, whatever it is, I've decided to stop. 
And so that, that's what was really powerful about that experience. And then coming off of it and like, I'm sitting in the green room before and like, where, who's the people that saw me in, in the room before, the girls? Where are you, did you guys leave already? You got your picture and ran? <laughs> Whatever, there's these four girls that were walking in the hallway and I was like sitting in the, in the green room and they came out and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I'm such a fan, I'm like a fan of me, like this dude? <laughs> I don't have fans, like stop, come on in, let's hang out. But like that's the truth, like I've gotten this positive affirmation from the world that if I truly just lean into who I am and I'm just honest and I just put my best foot forward, like things are going to work out. And so to like bring it back to like why I'm here, what's the point of this story, why did I just go on this diatribe and talk about all this stuff for the last 35, 40 minutes? I, I don't actually know. I, I don't know. All I know is that like, I'm still in the middle of like building my life. I'm still in the middle of building my business. Things are not perfect. When I have opportunities like this, I say yes because I believe that if one person in this audience was affected by something I said tonight, then it was worth it to get up this morning at six o'clock and drive out to the airport and fly down here. And like, as you guys launch into this like safe spring break stuff, it's like, I'm, I'm just gonna say like, I saw, I saw a shirt when I was running at the track today in the wellness center and it said like, pirates party harder. And I was like, yeah, pirates party harder. Damn right they do. And they also party smarter. Like, that's what came to mind next for me. Like, if you're going to go out and you're going to do the coke, like, this is not an endorsement to do cocaine. But if you are, like, test that shit. Like, there are kits you can get to test it to make sure it's not laced with fentanyl. If you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling like you can't reach out to someone, you absolutely can. Myself, I will respond to DMs. I got people and things and, and, and they're watching that stuff and they will write you back. And like, I guess I'll just close with this is like, you know, I don't know again like who's in this room and I would imagine like if you're showing up here, you might not even be the people that I need to reach, right? Like the person that I truly need to reach is probably at the bar getting hammered or holed up in their room thinking about why they don't wanna live anymore. And so like the challenge for me to all of you is to take something from this, lean into something Find some charitable organization or some way that you can give back. And just be aware of the people around you. Because if you knew everyone's story, if you knew, if you look left and you look right, you think you know the people that you're sitting next to. You don't. Because if you did, you wouldn't be jealous. You surely, you, 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 you wouldn't be mad. You wouldn't be upset. You wouldn't bully them. You wouldn't make fun of them. Because you have no idea what the other human, humans in your life are going through. So I encourage you to be a better person. I encourage you to understand that there is a way to party safely. I do it all the time. Again, if you're gonna go out, have your fun, try to be smart about it. The Narcan thing, just so, you, just so you understand it, the guys that were gonna get trained, I carry this everywhere. So this is Narcan, if you don't know what Narcan in is, it's an overdose reversal drug. I will get a little bit louder about this one. So fentanyl is working its way into the drug scene and fentanyl is a synthetic opiate that is 50 times stronger than like the Oxycontin and the hydrocodone and all the stuff that I was doing when I was getting high which means a little pebble of that stuff can kill you. And so if you are in a frat and you are in a sorority and you have five minutes, it takes five minutes, go get trained and have this. If you blast it up someone's nose, nothing bad can happen. 
If you think someone's overdosing, it's like using Afrin. It's literally that simple. It could save a life. So like I encourage Greek life and all you people to have it in the dorms and everywhere else. Um, and with that, I'm going to end. I want to say thank you so much for everyone for, for coming. I'm going to hang out tonight and just like let's, let's have a little fun.